News of the Times Twisted Tales Tuesday The Brighton Railway Murderer Percy Lefroy Mapleton Welcome to this episode of Twisted Tales Tuesday. Usually we pull together several stories of a same theme for these episodes, but the story of this murder on the railway is convoluted and deserves its own episode. The Brighton Railway murder story involving Percy Lefroy Mapleton gripped the nation in 1881, with the highly brutal murder of Isaac Gold in a first-class railway carriage from London to Brighton. The Case The case handled incredibly poorly from the start, despite suspicions by various authorities involving the brutal murder, theft, pretended attack, escape, capture, and dramatics. This case was also famous as being the first use of a forensic composite sketch sent out onto wanted posters and into newspapers to attempt to capture the escaped suspect, Percy Lefroy Mapleton. For our regular listeners, note the quickness of offers of monetary rewards for information leading to the suspect of this crime, and compare this with the ignoring of pleas for offers of rewards for information leading to the capture of the Ripper a few years later. We hope you enjoy the show. The Brighton Railway Murder, 1881 This case from June 1881 in Brighton gripped the nation at the time. What appears to be one case ends up being a feint to cover another case. It begins with the appearance of a gentleman who gives his name as Percy Mapleton Lefroy, disembarking from a train at Preston Park Station outside of Brighton that had come from London Bridge. Mr. Lefroy is dishevelled, distressed and bloody. Mr. Lefroy claims he has been attacked on the train, who hit him on the head, leaving him insensible. He had come from a first-class carriage, which he said he had shared with two other gentlemen, an elderly man and a fellow countryman. Lefroy's explanation seemed plausible to the ticket collector, as Lefroy had lost his hat, collar and tie, and looked to be covered in blood. A gold watch chain hanging from one of Lefroy's boots is commented upon. Lefroy responds that he put it there for safety. The station master arranges for a platform inspector to take Lefroy to the police station in the town hall, while the ticket collector is sent to the railway police to advise them of the occurrence. At the police station, Lefroy makes an official complaint regarding the attack. He states he has suffered and generously offers a reward for the capture of the ruffian. He is then taken to the county hospital to have his injuries treated. It is found that all of his injuries are superficial and would not account for the amount of blood he is covered in. Doctors wanted to detain him, but Lefroy insisted upon his leaving as he stated he had an important engagement in London, despite his just having arrived from London to Brighton. Lefroy is taken back to the police station, purchasing a replacement collar and tie along the way, and interviewed by several police officers, including the chief constable. He was then taken back to Brighton Station, where there seems to have been suspicions. Lefroy is searched, where two old counterfeit coins are found in his possession. Lefroy denies all knowledge of them. Meanwhile, the railway carriage of the debacle has been shunted for examination. There is blood everywhere, on the floorboard, the mat, and the door handle. Three bullet marks are discovered, and there is clear evidence that a fierce struggle 
has taken place within the carriage. More coins are found which are later shown to be similar to those that have been found on Lifroy. Whilst the inspection of the carriage was underway, Lefroy is allowed to return to London accompanied by Detective Sergeant George Holmes. Simultaneous to Lefroy's trip back to London accompanied by a policeman, a search of the line has been organised where the body of an elderly man later identified as a retired corn merchant by the name of Gold was found in Bolcom Tunnel. Mr. Gold had been shot and brutally and repeatedly stabbed. A knife found near the body was covered in blood. Mr. Gold also appeared to have been robbed of his watch and gold chain and a considerable amount of money. The news of the findings of the body drew intense suspicion on Lefroy. Telegrams were sent from Brighton telling Holmes to not let Lefroy out of his sight. Upon reaching London, Lefroy convinces Holmes to accompany him to an address at Wallington, Surrey, which Lefroy stated was a boarding house run by a relative. He wished to change his clothing. Holmes agreed. Holmes waited outside as Lefroy changed his clothing inside, and Lefroy disappeared. From the Belfast Telegraph, the 28th of June, 1881, Mysterious Occurrence. A mysterious occurrence is reported on the Brighton Railway by a Mr. Lefroy, who states, he was yesterday afternoon assaulted in a carriage and rendered insensible. An old gentleman who had been an occupant of the same carriage was subsequently found dead in a tunnel. The Central News says the railway carriage in which the murder was committed yesterday afternoon on the Brighton Railway is still detained at Brighton, pending the inquest and police inquiries. The carriage is much blood-stained, and the two bullets are still embedded therein. At present, the police have no clue to the countryman who was reported to be one of the occupants of the compartment, and today they are unable to find Mr. Lefroy, who was injured. His clothes are at his address at Wallington, but he himself has left. The police are most anxious to find him, as they regard his evidence as most important in unravelling the mystery. The police authorities have now no doubt that the murder of Mr. Gold on the Bright Railway yesterday was committed by the man Lefroy, whose plausible story disarmed the railway officials of suspicion. A country-wide search is made to find Lefroy, with the first forensic composite sketch created and dispersed as a wanted poster and in newspapers. From the Belfast Telegraph on the 28th of June, 1881. Wanted, Arthur Mapleton. The police have circulated bills headed wanted for murder and then given a description of Lefroy. He is known to them as Arthur Mapleton, labourer, slight build, aged 22, head bandaged from pistol wound, and scratches on her hands, had a valuable gold watch. Age 22, middle height, very thin, sickly appearance, scratches on throat, wound on head, probably clean-shaved, low felt hat, black coat, teeth much discoloured. He is very round-shouldered, and his thin overcoat hangs in awkward folds about his spare figure. His forehead and chin are both receding. He has a slight moustache and a very small dark whiskers. His jawbones are prominent, his cheeks sunken and sallow, and his teeth fully exposed when laughing. His upper lip is thin and drawn inwards. His eyes are grey and large. 
His gait is singular. He is inclined to slouch, and when not carrying a bag, his left hand is usually in his pocket. He generally carries a crutch stick. The Inquest The inquest was run by Win E. Baxter of Ripper fame and lasted several days. The inquest results were ruthless in their assessment of the railway authorities, the Brighton police, and in particular, Detective George Holmes. The jury, after consultation for about 20 minutes, returned a verdict of willful murder against Percy Lefroy, alias Mapleton, alias Lee, alias Coppin. Upon the intelligence of the verdict reaching Scotland Yard, an offer of £200 reward was issued for the apprehension of Lefroy. One half of the reward to be paid by the government, and the other by the London and Brighton Railway Company. The story gripped the nation. An MP was mistaken for Lefroy from the composite sketch, which was everywhere, and some seventeen others were hauled into various police stations for the mistaken identity of Lefroy. There were also reports of Lefroy boarding a steamer to escape. On the 8th of July, Lefroy was found in Stepney, hiding under the name of Park. Blood-stained clothing was found in his room, and he was also identified as a man who had exchanged some coins and had pawned a revolver. The evidence against him was overwhelming. Capture From the Exmoor Journal on the 9th of July, 1881, The Brighton Railway Murderer, The Apprehension of Lefroy Last night, Lefroy was apprehended at 33 Smith Street, Stepney, by inspectors Swanson, Thompson and Jarvis. These officers from the Criminal Investigation Department had a clue afforded them that Lefroy had been for some days hiding in the house in question, and they made the arrest shortly after eight o'clock. A four-wheeled cab was called from Stepney Green, and the accused was quietly removed and conveyed to Scotland Yard. With her, Mr Vincent, the director of the Criminal Investigation Department, and Chief Superintendent Williamson had repaired on having telegraphic receipt of the news of the address. From the Yorkshire Post and Leeds Intelligentsia, the 11th of July, 1881, the examination of Lefroy. Lefroy, after his arrest at Stepney, was conveyed to King Street, Westminster Police Station, by inspectors Swanson and Jarvis, as already reported. While riding with them in the cab, he said to Jarvis that had the officers not arrested him, he would have rendered himself into the hands of justice a day or two later, because he was getting sick of the suspense and anxiety. Although very pale, he did not lose his composure. The officers state that his coolness was most strikingly shown at the time of his arrest. He then not only received them a calm manner, but also displayed a theatrical air when they were searching the room for the evidence of his guilt. It was stated on Friday that the prisoner would be conveyed to East Grinstead by the 7.35 train on Saturday morning from Victoria but at the last moment the destination was changed to Lewis Jail. A crowd had collected in front of the station on Saturday morning when at quarter past seven o'clock Inspector and Swanton drove up. Lefroy, who had previously refreshed himself with coffee and sandwiches, was then visited in his cell by Chief Inspector Williamson, whom he greeted with a cordial good morning. After some little delay, the prisoner 
who looked in much better condition than he had done upon the previous night, was placed in the cab with two inspectors and rapidly driven off toward Victoria, the crowd pursuing the cab for some distance. The people were, however, dispersed by a number of constables, and the vehicle, attended by other conveyances, made its way to Victoria Station, which was reached at about half-past seven. Here again, crowds had assembled, and a large body of the A Division had much difficulty keeping back unauthorised intruders. The train left Victoria Station punctually at 7.35, by which time the platform was lined with spectators. Inspectors Jarvis and Swanson, who rode along with Lefroy, drew down the carriage blinds and completely screened him from observation. On the way down, Lefroy chatted with the inspectors and smoked cigarettes, with which he was supplied at the junction. Much curiosity was evinced when the train is sighted with the prisoner and crowds of several hundred people were gathered on the platform. Very few, however, saw him, the blinds immediately being drawn down when the train stopped at any station. The Croydon station master was, however, permitted to see him, whom he at once recognised. At Redhill Junction, where the train also stopped, there was another crowd of spectators. The next stoppage made was Haywards Heath, where the party changed from the Brighton to the Lewis line, it having been determined the way to take Lefroy to the latter place instead of East Grinstead, the coroner's warrant permitting of him being taken to either place. As Lefroy walked quickly along, he was at once recognised by those on the platform and in the crowded Brighton train. A roar of exaggeration saluted him as he passed carriages and entered the Lewis train, which stood waiting on the opposite side of the platform. Lefroy became livid at the shouts with which he had received and hastened to escape from them. The following minutes of evidence are literary copies of the document read out by the clerk. The witness examined was Inspector Swanton of the Criminal Investigation Department, who deposed quarter to eight last night in company with Inspector Jarvis and Police Constable Hopkins. I went to 32 Smith Street in Stepney. On entering the front room of the first floor, I saw the prisoner, Percy Lefroy Mapleton, in an armchair. Addressing him, I said, Percy Lefroy Mapleton? In reply, he said, I expect so. I told him I was a police officer and that I should apprehend him with the charge of willfully murdering Mr. Gold on the Brighton Railway on June the 27th. In answer, he said, I am not obliged to make any reply, and I think I better not make any answer. He then said, I will qualify that by saying, I am not guilty. No further conversation ensued, and I took him to Scotland Yard and brought him down to Lewis this morning and handed him over to Superintendent Berry. Inspector Jarvis said, Last night at a quarter to eight I went to Smith Street Stepney in company with the last witness. Upon my entering the room, Swanton, having done so previously, said to me, This person admits to being Lefroy. I then searched the prisoner and found on him one shilling in silver. In a chest of drawers in the same room I found a black cloth vest, two caps, three collars, a false moustache and whiskers, and a portion of a coloured flannel shirt. In a cupboard in another part of the room I found a number of cuttings of a material similar to the flannel shirt. On the chest of drawers 
I find a pair of scissors, a bottle of arnica, and a briar root pipe. On showing him the scissors, I said, Do these belong to you? He said, Yes, I use them for cutting off my moustache. The waistcoat had blood marks upon it inside and out but mostly on the right breast. One of the collars also had blood upon it, and some of the cutting materials, similar to the shirt, also apparently was blood-stained. Swanton and I afterwards took the prisoner to Scotland Yard in a cab, and on the way he said, I am glad you found me. I am sick of it. I should have given myself up in a day or two, I have regretted it ever since, but I ran away, and it put a different complexion on the case. I could not bear the exposure. I feared that certain matters in connection with my family would be made public. I suppose I shall be allowed to see a solicitor. From the Greenock Advertiser, the 23rd of July, 1881. Lefroy, who has now been lodged in Lewis jail, maintains his cool demeanour and refuses to allow the plea of insanity to be put forward, threatening to dispense with the assistance of counsel and conduct his own case if it is made a prominent part of the defence. He persists in his original statement that there was a third person in the compartment who assaulted him and committed the murder. Lefroy desires to be tried at the Central Criminal Court, believing that he cannot have a fair trial in the county, and efforts will probably be made by the Maidstone Assizes to have the trial removed. Information about Lefroy as Lefroy waits in jail for his trial to come, more information is found regarding him. He went by several aliases. He had worked in Melbourne, Australia, as a writer of spicy police reports, where he was known under the name of Lefroy Mapleton. It was a precarious living, as he was not always able to get work. He told a number of fabricated stories regarding his family and social standing, that his father, who was dead, had been an incumbent of a well-known church in London, simultaneously using an alias's name of a well-known preacher in South London, that his father had been a partner in an old firm of solicitors in London, that his mother was a Belgian lady of good family, he was also known to either drink heavily or teetotal. That he had taken on the alias of Coppin at one time in reference to the highly respectable Mr. George Coppin of the Theatre Royal in Melbourne. In short, Lefroy was a known spinner of lies and deceit and would sometimes lie even when he didn't have to. The trial. In keeping with his perchance for theatrics, Lefroy requested to attend his trial in full evening dress in court as he thought it would impress the jury. This was rejected, although it was conceded that he would be allowed to wear a silk top hat. Lefroy was also seen to play to the crowds his amateur theatrics in Australia coming to the fore. He enjoyed the attention he received and was known to put on studied airs in the courtroom when he could see the sketch artist at work. The trial of Percy Lefroy Mapleton took place on the 2nd of November 1881 for the murder of Frederick Isaac Gold with the courtroom filled with spectators. The prosecution evidence was overwhelming. Lefroy was caught in lie after lie, including the found stolen gold watch, which he claimed he had bought a few days before,
but which was found to be conspicuously untrue as the watch numbers matched up with those of Mr. Gold. There was the found blood-stained clothing in his room. A woman who lived in Hawley testified that she had seen two men violently fighting in a carriage train as it had passed the window of her cottage. The pawned revolver, the coins, the initial histrionic performances regarding his supposed injuries, the gold chain in his boot, and the found coins similar to those of Mr. Gold, all served to convict Lefroy. Lefroy's defence team had wanted to use an insanity plea, as certainly many of Lefroy's actions had been decidedly odd. Lefroy adamantly refused. He continued to stick by his story of the unknown third man, who supposedly bashed him on the head and insisted that the unknown man must have been the person to enact the brutal slaying of Mr. Gold. The jury did not believe him. From the Sheffield Daily Telegraph on the 9th of November, 1881, verdict and sentence. The jury retired at 25 minutes to three o'clock and returned into court after an absence of 10 minutes with a verdict of guilty. The prisoner was asked by the clerk of arraigns if he had anything to say as to why the sentence of death should not be passed upon him. The prisoner stated, no, only to thank the jury for their kindness. Lord Chief Justice Coleridge briefly passed sentence of death. He said the prisoner had been convicted on the clearest evidence of an atrocious murder, a murder perpetrated in a train upon a man who had done him no wrong. It was right and just that he should die. Lord Coleridge put on the black cap and, bowing his head, pronounced the capital sentence of the law. Lefroy, standing in dramatic attitude, turned to the jury and, while clutching the railing of the dock while the sentence was passed, on its conclusion bowed to the jury and said, Gentlemen of the jury, some day too late you will learn that you have murdered me. The Execution The dramatics of the trial with the silk top hat Lefroy had insisted on wearing throughout as he felt it would give him a better air of respectability that is repeated in the execution. Gone was much of Lefroy's bravado that he had had during the trial. Comments were made of his extreme pallor and the stumbling that took place to the scaffold and the fatal beam requiring Marwood, the executioner, to push him to the place of death. Lefroy's execution as described by a reporter on the scene. From the Daily Telegraph, the 13th of November, 1881, Hanging a Murderer. The words of the clergyman rising and falling upon the ears of the spectators were evidently lost upon Lefroy. He did not appear to hear the passing bell, but looked upwards as though in an agony of fear, and so stumbled helplessly along. It was not far, only a few score yards in all, but the march to the grave, or rather to the scaffold, seemed terribly painful. All the bravado that was witnessed in the dock at Maston had gone. The terrors of death were in full force upon the hapless culprit. As he approached the scaffold, this was particularly noticeable. He could scarcely take the steps which was to place him where he had never stood before and from whence he would never step again. And Marwood, who at no instant let go of the belt, was fain once more to push him forward. It was evidently not the moment for ceremony with the hangman, who was now once more very busy placing the tall young man 
up to whose shoulders his own face scarcely reached, under the cross tree, stooping down to strap up his legs and then fumbling about with a white glazed linen cap, he now essayed to put over the trembling youth's face. I do not suppose for a moment that Marwood intended to be rough. He was possibly excited and anxious to do everything as, as expeditiously as possible, but it certainly appeared to me that in attempting to fix the cap on Lefroy's head and in pulling it down over his face, he hurt the prisoner somewhat unnecessarily. The worst of this was, however, yet to come. The long rope dangling about Lefroy had now to be adjusted, and the thimble through which the noose ran to the place beneath his neck. I did not time it, but it may have lasted only a few seconds, but to me it seemed appallingly long, while the swaying of Lefroy's body showed the agony he was enduring. I cannot tell whether the sound of the clergyman's voice, which continued all the while the preparations went on, was of great consolation to him. His last look, as the white cap was produced, was lifted heavenward, his pallid face turned upwards, his lips moving as though in prayer, but so soon as the cap was over his face, he began to sway, so much that I expected he would fall before the business was finished. At last, however, all was ready, and Marwood, grasping the hand of his victim, stepped back. There was another awkward pause, apparently for the purpose of allowing the clergyman to finish the sacred invocation in which he was engaged, and then the lever being pulled back, the trap doors opened, and Lefroy falls with a terrible thud into the cavern below. Down ten foot, as was presently shown by the measurement of a tape line, he had dropped, the whole weight of his body falling upon the neck, which, receiving such a strain, was instantly broken, so completely that the body never gave so much as one convulsive shudder. But turning half round, hung swaying in the cold morning air, enveloped by a haze of steam rising from the corpse, and showing by the visible disconnection of the vertebrae and by the open hands how sudden death had been. That concludes this episode of Twisted Tale Tuesdays, The Brighton Railway Murderer. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We're aiming for 1,000 subscribers. We upload five times a week. Saturdays are our serial killer Saturdays. We review one of the historical serial killers in our large database. Sundays, a new series we are trialling, Eccentric Sundays, where we look into Great Britain's rich history of quirky, odd and eccentric characters. Mondays, an in-depth investigation into a famous story of its day. And on Tuesdays, we present a pool together collection of stories from our database. For example, Murders on Railways. And Wednesdays is Whitechapel Wednesdays, where we chronologically go through the newspaper stories related in Whitechapel, leading to the series of gruesome crimes of 1888, and arguably beyond. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.